Blue Mountains is unique. It's in a heavily ag dominated landscape, uh, but it has a lot of very rare features because of the rock outcrops that are found here. It was not farmed, so there's a lot of remnant prairie and those rock outcrops also have a lot of unique plant species. And with the stream here, we have a lot of aquatic species that are rare or endangered as well. So it's, we kind of call it our little gem in the prairie here. Because the bedrock is so exposed here, we have a lot of water flowing overland. Also, it's easy to access the groundwater here. So the park itself has had drinking water issues for a long time. So we knew anything we could do to improve local water quality uh, would be really important. You know, the, uh, the reservoir um, had long since served its purpose. It was, was put in to provide water recreation. At the time, water quality, speculated it was probably better than it is today. So all the silt that had come in had, had really filled in, and, and you could see that when the basin drained, there was probably six to eight feet deep silt deposits that had filled this basin in. This at one time was a deep reservoir, and the water quality was actually listed as impaired by the Minnesota Pollution Control Agency. Pretty dismal in this part. You know, uh, the dam itself was an active fish barrier. The only species that would live in this lake were ones that can handle poor water quality, low dissolved oxygen at times, you know, bullheads, green sunfish, less desirable species. The other problem that exists with these agricultural streams is often that they're prone to extreme floods, and that's certainly the case here. In fact, this whole uh, Missouri uh, drainage part of Minnesota is prone to extreme flooding. In 2014, the dam washed out. The emergency spillway failed over time after the major flooding and about 2015 we started having conversations on what we were going to do about it. We had two options of rebuilding the dam to, to modern day specs or to do a stream restoration and being in the Department of Natural Resources and being this state property we wanted to make it a more natural feel than a, a reservoir that had a lot of pollutants in it from its upstream watershed and, and water quality impairments. Because the dam and the impoundment itself was historic, there were negative impacts to um, the historical and cultural features of the park. So we had to weigh those with the benefits that we thought we would gain from the uh, natural resources, um, and specifically the Topeka Shiners in the stream that we would be creating habitat for. We can have a public meeting and show them exactly what the problems are in detail, both the physical and the hydrologic the geomorphic problems, but also the ecological and biological ones. And just sharing with them the facts that we've collected over 30 plus years of research and giving them a vision of what it might look like. I remember back in the late 90s visiting the site when people swam in the reservoir. I don't think they realized that it had uh, high levels of fecal coliforms and that kind of thing. And there's also misinformation where people thought this was somehow moderating flow, which it really wasn't. So getting the right set of facts, I think is absolutely critical in uh, uh, bringing people on board. And we just decided after public meetings and, and internal meetings to do a stream restoration here. And one of the things that we talked about all the time was watershed health. How to measure watershed health, we use five components. So we're, we look at hydrology, geomorphology, which is uh, river stability, how rivers change over time and how they create the landscape, water quality, connectivity with the fish passage or the ability to connect to uh, an adjacent floodplain, and then biology, so the fish and and macroinvertebrates. When we get those five together, we can see kind of where the disruptions are that are causing watershed health issues. You know, any disruption in one of them can cause issues to all the other four. And that's that's something to, to really understand is that they're all interconnected. So you make a change to one and you could have an impact to another. And any projects that we do, we want to make sure that our impact is either null or beneficial to the other ones. So if we're doing something to make river stability better, we want to make sure we're not making water quality worse or hydrology worse. You know, we want to make sure that it's either beneficial for those other components or there's a null value there. It's not doing anything to that component. It's a really important objective of ours. 
Our philosophy in restoration is setting up the processes of the stream so that that stream will maintain itself over time and won't require maintenance and the natural processes will take over. A channel is going to change over time and that's what it naturally does. We want natural structures to make the channel somewhat stable until it gets to a point where it can meander again. We don't want it to, to blow out, but just having that natural pattern that dimension that can move water and sediment of its watershed. But it will move in a natural progression down its valley with the proper pattern, profile, and dimension. What we uh, did in the design was to build rapids. And uh, so we added that feature here to, to address the sediment accumulation in the reservoir, step the grade of the stream up so that it has a connected floodplain in the reservoir in that we have a stream that accesses its floodplain during a flood and comes back down to the channel during lower flows. You know, a small channel in a, in a wide valley that can get out in its floodplain can detain a lot more water than a reservoir can in a flood event. Is that there's just all this flood storage and then once the flood goes away, it goes with it. It's really important to understand what kind of channel you have to create to deal with the watershed that, that is coming towards it. So you don't want to have a channel that's too small for all the water coming or too big because then it can't move its sediment. So in order to do so, you have to survey reaches nearby that have remained stable over time, which we consider reference reaches. Where the, the channel is in good shape, it's connected to its floodplain, it has the correct pattern and profile for that channel. So when we have that, we can take those measurements and then translate them to another area and get that correct dimension, pattern, and profile of the creek. And that's what was done here. We not only looked at those reference sites, we also looked at the downstream that still had some intact channel. And then we looked at all the known narrow deep prairie channels in the western part of the state and compared how those values we're matching up so that we knew that we had got the right dimensions to, to do this restoration. It's natural for a channel to erode laterally and change its path, but if it's changing its width and its depth, then we have a problem. And we want to make sure that that's not something we have right away, especially when this entire floodplain was basically bare right after creating the channel. We want to make sure that we're not setting the channel up for failure before vegetation establishes. Until we recognize that we got to reestablish those broader floodplains that we historically had, we're going to be fighting a losing battle if we try to stick that all into this narrow little channel and think that we've solved our problems across the scale. So understanding not only the form of the, the channel and the ecosystem that depends on it, the habitats that are in that, but the long-term processes that happen over decades and, and even centuries. The dam stopped those species from swimming upstream from the Rock River, uh, and so basically Mound Creek was out of reach, but we've opened up well over a half a mile channel here for that habitat, and to just know that we provided that habitat and all those species are using it is, is really exciting. Just the ability to be able to get upstream and downstream is huge for a lot of species and once you remove that barrier, those fish tend to come back almost instantaneously. We're able to find records for uh, 37 species in the watershed and of those 13 didn't exist upstream of this dam and frankly most of the species that were in the reservoir were at least partly maintained by stocking. In a site like this, we might have fish that are only up here for a matter of days to spawn and then move back down. And you might think, well, that's not important then. And it may be absolutely critical to sustaining a broader ecosystem. Yeah, the ecological benefits of water quality, increased fish passage, the riparian zone vegetation is reestablished. You get also wildlife corridors in the floodplain that allow game animals to move up and down as well as all our native species. Of course, the birds, you can hear them right now. <laughs>
we hear a lot of compliments of birders coming through that are seeing these species, you, these bird species, uh, stopping here during the migration. What was surprising is the Topeka shiners moved back in immediately. And I think it helped. We had a little bit of a flood that filled up those oxbows and they were able to get in there. And it was really gratifying to see, like in the first year after the project, we were finding them in pretty good numbers. And we found Plains Top Minnow in lower numbers in one location as well. So it was kind of a, if you build it, they will come. And they really did come. And we're hoping additional species will as well. I have also noticed that this spot is amazing for fireflies in the summer. I think it's the wet habitat. We inadvertently made really good firefly habitat, so that's pretty cool. When you put in a stream like this, you get floodplain reconnection, and that reconnection helps nutrients get processed correctly. As the flood pulses up, it gets into the vegetation, and that vegetation can uptake nutrients and, and improve water quality and uh, reduce sediment. You know, and that's a good thing about a stream restoration is that when water floods, we have this entire floodplain with vegetation to take up some of the nutrients that are going downstream, and, and that protects areas like Laverne from getting more of the, the water quality impairments that could have come from, from Mound Creek. We're, we're treating it here in the floodplain in, in higher flows, and in low flows, we're treating it within the channel by having natural habitat and natural meandering and, and nutrient cycling that happens naturally in a, in a meandering stream as opposed to a channelized stream that forces the water on downstream. So once this channel went online, the water stopped flowing through the old channel, so we had to quickly move all those species over. We had a mussel survey where we scooped up all the mussels and moved them over, and then scooped up all the fish and moved them over. So that was a really fun part of the project. And it was all hands on deck. We had scuba divers and we had everybody. We had people from St. Paul, you know, just grabbing mussels and grabbing turtles, and it was really fun. The neat part of that is that this is always a collaborative thing. It's not one person going in in designing something. We had uh, Molly Trunell that that is an expert in prairie plant vegetation. We had the clean water crew collecting the local data, hydrologists that help with permitting, other park staff that think about, well, what do we need in terms of trails and, and access so that people can enjoy this site. There's a tremendous number of people, including the people that work to provide the funding, you know, the representatives, the whole works, they're all part of this. And we have more and more engineers now that are starting to understand natural river systems and have an appreciation for the ecosystems that they support. I'm very happy with the way it turned out. Just a credit to all the biologists and the stream ecologists and the hydrologists who worked on it. They designed a really nice channel, created excellent habitats. There's a, there's a large bridge downstream that really provides a nice view of the whole valley. And it's just a fantastic place to come and see wildlife. The public's out here enjoying it. It's a good mix of recreation opportunities that replace the, the swimming pool. The really important thing in restoration generally is that it's not so much about building something. It's, it's about restoring the ability of the stream to build its own habitat. That's probably the most important thing to take away <laughs> in all of stream restoration is not that we just build the channel right, and that's obviously important, but if we don't restore those long-term processes, we only have a short-term restoration because structures are always best when they're first installed, but the stream is best in the long-term, and the uh, processes continue to improve in time. If there's one indicator of success, it, it tend to be the biodiversity of the, the work you've done and the biological implications of what you've done.